Have you seen me dice bag? <laughs> Files. Hello, my name is Dirt the Dice, the host of the Grognard Files podcast, where we talk bobbins about tabletop RPGs from back in the day and today. This is a little extra where we take a break from our normal programming and format to bring something a bit different. This time we talk to Paul Fricker co-designer of Call of Cthulhu, about Full Fathom 5, his scenario that's available print-on-demand from the Miskatonic repository via drive Through RPG. Set on board a whaling ship, the Barclay, in 1847, this is a thrilling, unconventional Call of Cthulhu one-shot with atmosphere and a host of interesting characters. It was the discussion topic for the latest Grognard Files book club that meets on the first Sunday of every month, so it was great to fire questions at Paul following our informal discussion. Also included is a sample of actual play of the adventure, so you can get a sense of the scenario and what it feels like at the table. I should warn you now that this podcast contains spoilers, if you intend to play Full Fathom 5, then don't spoil it by listening to the pod. Wait till later, after you've played it. If you want to be a keeper, then keep listening, as I believe that you'll get some hints and tips on how to run the adventure for your players. Blythe, our resident rules lawyer, joins me in the Zoom of role-playing rambling to discuss John Carpenter's 1982 movie, The Thing, so we can learn techniques to make our games better. There's also an I'll Get My Coat at the very end where we discuss our closing time chatter and the gaming thoughts that are occupying us at the moment. Until then, ramblers, let's get rambling. Book Club. So we want to welcome to the book club to talk about Full Fathom 5. Paul Fricker, hi Paul. Good morning, Dirk. And where are you coming from? Because I know that you're on your travels, aren't you, at the moment? I'm back in England. I'm uh, at present. I'm in a bike shed at the back of one of the halls of residence at Leicester University for Continuum Con. And how's that going? It's going well. Yeah, I arrived on Friday, ran a game Friday afternoon, and uh, played some more games yesterday, and got some more today. It's like you know, there's Gen Con on the same weekend, but you know, there's Continuum here in Leicester. And Continuum's got a strong role in uh, Cthulhu's history, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. It used to be uh, the Convulsion Convention, which was a Chaosium-based con. So it was RuneQuest and uh, it was Garantha and Call of Cthulhu. And that kind of continues, but now it's more, you know, it's diversified. It's not just Chaosium games. It's a, ho- it's a whole range of games on here. The standard kind of range you'd expect at most conventions. And isn't it where you and Mike uh, pitched the idea for uh, seventh edition? Yes, I believe it was many years ago. Yep, we uh, there were representatives from uh, Chaosium here, and that was the yeah after a, a Chaosium seminar, as I recall. Me and Mike uh, sidled up to Charlie and talked to him about a new edition of Call of Duty. And uh, you mentioned you're back in the UK because you've been down darker trails, haven't you, or for recent weeks? I have. <laughs> Yes, been riding horses through Monument Valley and uh, and walking down into the Grand Canyon. It's been been a lot of fun. And was that a great source of inspiration? We'd love to know what was uh, going through your head as you were passing through those uh, great monuments. Well, <laughs> <laughs> my family thought it was a family holiday, but it was really a Call of Cthulhu research trip. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think there'll be some good inspiration uh, for scenarios. It's uh, just a fantastic yeah america has so many great landscapes and so much so so like inspiring uh meeting the people and the places and uh yeah it's just great well at the book club we've been talking about full fathom five and so which we've uh, enjoyed having a good discussion about and uh, oh, <laughs> uh we've got some questions for you but just to just 
so that if people don't are not aware of um, uh, the scenario, g- give us the, um, the the elevator pitch. Okay, well, the elevator pitch, I guess, is it's a scenario somewhat inspired by Moby Dick. So you're playing characters on board a whaling ship in the mid 1800s out in the South Pacific, and you know, strange things start to happen. Beyond that, I suppose. It's a bit of a, a slasher movie as well. Yeah, Moby Dick meets a slasher movie. Because, yeah, that was yeah. kind of the that was the aim. And uh, you put this out on uh, the Miskatonic uh, repository. Just tell people a little bit about that because that that has really grown, hasn't it, over the last couple of years? Oh, it has. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I put I chose to put Full Fathom Five on the repository partly because it's very much a standalone scenario. You know, you couldn't really play ongoing characters in that. It's, it very much uses the pre-gens. And at the end of it, I mean, somebody asked me if I'd write a sequel. I mean, I, I can kind of see that you could perhaps pick up some of the, if there were survivors, you could perhaps pick them up and play them again. But, you know, it, it wouldn't really fit into perhaps a regular book of scenarios, but it, it was very much a standalone scenario. And I think the repository is particularly good for that. But also the repository is just a, an avenue for anybody that wants to write a Call of Cthulhu scenario and self-publish it uh so you're getting financially you're getting half the income from the sales some of it uh, some of the rest goes to calcium and some of it goes to drive through rpg it's a, it's a fairly low risk venture if you're able to write your scenario do the editing and get some artwork and do the, the layout now all that when I say it, it sounds quite straightforward. When you do it, it's actually quite a lot of work. So if you have written for, you know, if you're somebody who has written something and maybe had it published in a magazine or a book or, or anything like that, you've done the writing part. When it comes to all the rest, as somebody who's written stuff before, I knew there was other things involved, but I didn't realize quite how much work there'd be in putting it all together you know, to actually get it through to the final product. It's a rewarding thing to do, but it is quite a bit of work. And do um, KCM provide templates for the layout? Yeah, they provide templates for use in um, InDesign and Affinity, which is a, um, a fairly low price. I think you can get it for like, it was on offer at £25. I think it's maybe £50 for the layout package. Uh, and that's a, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a very good package for doing layout. And they also provide a lot of advice on where to get art. Um, there's lots of you know resources that you can use. Um, so that yeah, you know, they will offer support. I mean, partly because they've got you know they've got a vested interest in helping you to get a good product online. So yeah, and and also there's a Miskatonic University repository. No, sorry, Miskatonic repository uh, kind of support group on Facebook. So if you have any questions, there are lots of people there that will jump on and, and give really good advice. And uh, you were involved in a, an online course, weren't you, to help people self-publish and write for this? Yeah, so there's a group called the Storytelling Collective. They offer a lot of really good courses. I've done one or two of them you know, um, independently. They, they, there's a, there is a, a small cost for them, but I found them really constructive. Much more so than, yeah. You know, I looked at the course and I thought, oh, that, that might be good. It was one about creativity. I thought, well, I'll, I'll give it a go because I wanted to test them out, see what it was like because I was writing for them. Yeah, I got quite a lot out of it. It was, it was really good. So then I was invited to write the course for writing. This. So let me take a step back. They do a course on writing adventures. So it's like write your first adventure. And I think the inspiration was, the uh, writer novel in a month and it that is just uh, a sort of community group that everybody gets together and you can participate and you can you know you can write i don't know what is 500 words a day or something for a month and you end up with you know, a novel the idea here was they'd offer a more structured course and they would provide um sort of small lessons each day and encouragement and forums where you can go on and sort of chat to other people about the process and through that month, if you follow the course and do the exercises, and yeah, at the end of that, you should have an adventure. I think the original idea was that it was a D&D adventure, and then they've offered a Call of Cthulhu path. 
So there's the sort of standard intro bit, and then the middle sort of third is all core Sulu. Uh, so that's that bit I worked on. And then the, the final bit is about um, the, the, the sort of the finishing off and the, the layout and so on. Um, so that was interesting because I've always sort of said there isn't a standard way to write a core Cthulhu scenario. And whilst I don't think there is, it was interesting kind of trying to structure advice on how to go about the process. Yeah, and hopefully it's, I mean, I've certainly heard some people say it was useful and, and there's been a lot of stuff published on the back of that. And although it's self-published, you have uh, commandeered uh, assistance from uh, your fellow podcasters at uh, the Good Friends of Jackson Elias. I see uh, Scott did editing work and uh, Matt did the layout. Yes, that's right. Yes, yes. And um, also John Sumro, um, the, another friend, well, uh, somebody I've, I've got to know through the show, a uh, fantastic artist. I kind of decided, you know, I want John to do the cover. Um, and he also did some internal artwork as well. So I think, you know, if you're going to publish, it's good to have some good artwork in there. But it is, you know, to anybody considering this, that is going to cost you some money. You, you must have enjoyed it, doing the art direction. I did, yes, yes. Uh, and there was a part where on the cover, there's a character in the bottom uh, left-hand corner. I think it is, I can't remember if it's the captain. Yeah, captain. Uh, but he's, 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 yeah, he's, he's kind of looking at, and sort of like this with his, with his arm back uh, and his face looking towards the, 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 the viewer. And I had to sort of pose for that bit and say, because when you're working with an artist, you've got to, you know, give them an art brief. And then they perhaps send you a sketch and you're like, well, that's not quite what I can mind. Can you kind of alter this bit? And it's so much easier just to give them a visual reference. Uh, so I thought, well, I'm just going to pose for that. And, and if you look at that, I think you can maybe see that it's me posing for that. I don't know. But uh, he, he's just really good to work with because he, he'll send me a sketch and then I'll comment on it and then he'll rework it. And it's kind of a very much back and forth two-way process. So that was, that was fantastic. And uh, one of the things uh, we should say um, at this point, we're going to start going into Full Fathom 5. And if you intend to uh, play, then fast forward now, because there's going to be uh, spoilers, I think, in this uh, discussion, inevitably. Um, so if you're going to uh, run the game, then you can carry on listening. But if you're going to play, I think you should uh, fast forward. Because one of the things that, that strikes me about this, uh, Paul, is the thing I hate about preparing scenarios is having to do uh, pre-gens for uh, convention games. And you've done 20-odd pre-gens uh, for this. Are you some kind of masochist? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the reason for that is, as we, as you've said, you know, spoilers ahoy, I wanted to have a stack of character sheets. This is inspired by a friend of mine, um, uh, Willard Foxen, who who talked to me about a scenario he had run, I think it was maybe for Godlike, like in a Russian prison camp or something like that. And uh, prisoners, you know, they, they 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 were just getting shot regularly, and they were just civilians. Every now every now and again, that you know, if your character was getting shot, you could make a roll, and if you made the roll, you had superpowers and you were able to like overcome the the adversity. Uh, but that meant they were burning through loads of characters. And he just had a massive stack of character sheets in the middle of the table. And I thought, well, that sounds like a really cool idea. So I kind of took inspiration from that and had the whole crew there. And to do that, they've got it all beyond character sheets. And the fact they're on a whaling ship in the middle of the ocean means that that's you know, total isolation. So those are the only 23 people are possibly going to be in in the game so they're all there in a stack of character sheets and they've all got individual characters as well haven't they and they've got character portraits and uh, a feeling of a life on board the ship so how difficult it was it to come up with that that was a tricky balance i mean in in reference to the character portraits that was uh you know quite a bit of research online finding period photographs and then taking a time jump back about 32 years and marrying an artist, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Lucy, who then did the, uh, the artwork for the, for the, uh, for the characters, which is, which is great. So, um, getting the 23, um, character portraits done. Yeah. That would be, that, that, that was a big job, but she was happy to do those. That, that was really nice. 
So thank you to Lucy. Getting the, the character backgrounds. Obviously, I think when you give players a pre-gen, it needs to be there needs to be a bit of a handle they can get hold of to play that character. But equally, sometimes you can give too much information to a player in that it's hard for them to assimilate all of that and actually portray it. And if you give them lots of information, they're perhaps constantly second guessing and say, oh, is that what my character would do? Am I playing this right? So I really want it just to be a few lines, especially when people are perhaps changing characters mid game. I wanted them to be able to easily pick it up, look at it, and just one or two hooks that they could say, oh, okay, that's what this character's like. Just enough to distinguish them. Some of them are fairly similar. Fairly early on in this scenario, one of the PCs will kill another one of the uh, player's uh, characters in a pretty graphic, because this is a slasher film aboard uh, Moby Dick. So that's it. So uh, it, it fairly, fairly early on. So that was the thing that when I first read it, I thought, goodness gracious, I don't think I've ever done that before. It is an inevitability that that that, that character is going to die, and that's that's pretty audacious, isn't it, to to, to do that? So, what well, just talk us through your thinking uh, on that, and uh, what why why it was a, a player character? When I started the scenario, it was going to be a part of a larger campaign called Poison Tree, which was a generational campaign uh, that Scott, Matt, and I wrote for Pelgrane. And it was a chapter in that book. And well, and anyway, then then that book got kind of revised and that that chapter, we dropped that chapter. Uh, and I thought, well, actually, you know, I've, I've done the work on it. I'd like to put it out. But when I started working on that, we sort of, I was given, well, not given it, but sort of came up with the outline of it being on a whaling ship. And then I had to come up with the scenario. So there was this premise of having it on a whaling ship in the 1850s. And some inspiration from the framework of the campaign. But then I thought, well, I don't know what to do with this. And so I, I went through the kind of process that I go through writing scenarios and just, just writing lots about it and doing some research. And then it occurred to me, well, it's got to be bad things happening on board. And then I think for some reason, I, I started thinking about it being a series of murders. And the thing with a slasher film is the characters that you're watching that get killed. If it's, if it's NPCs, well, it's not really having the same impact. It, it, it would just seem seems to have be more impactful if it's the player characters. And I thought, well, you've got this pool of characters, as I talked about before, that you can replace the person you're playing with you know, with a new character. So it just seemed like if I can contrive a way to have the player character killed off, then I, I like scenarios that do something a bit different, I guess. And yes, there is, well, there is a definite loss of agency on the player's part temporarily but they're soon replaced with a new you know it's, it's not like you're knocked out of the game so i want it to be a, a a different experience really you know something that feels different and um the way the player characters uh die is uh great uh, that's part of the thrill of it isn't it you've come up with some pretty graphic scenes um for uh the murders oh what that's they... good to hear <laughs> I always, I always throw in a fish as well in the uh, first uh, murder. I know that that's not described, but um, as the the drowning in the water, I always have a, a, a mackerel coming out of the mouth as well, just for oh, effect. Oh, so nice! It, yeah, so it can yeah, flap on yeah. the deck as uh, they're dead. Yeah, yeah. I think some of those things come to me as I'm running it. I maybe don't think of those things in advance, but when I'm running it, there's a kind of intensity of thought i suppose you, you're trying to get a reaction out of players and certain things just spring into your mind's eye like the, like the water sort of bubbling up into the mouth and not stopping if i recall correctly that was just something you know that, that seemed weird and shocking that i just threw in when i was running it i thought oh, well, I'll, yeah i'll put that in there's a lot of things in this scenario that i would expect players to do that they don't actually do in in reality so it's pretty clear the players know who did the murder, but they feel like their characters wouldn't know. Ignore this. It's a rug covering a hole. 
So I'm going to invite um, um, some questions from the uh, audience and uh, perhaps build on build on them. Um, so I'm going to invite in Chris, who's going to ask about uh, some of your experiences of playing. Hi, Paul. I was um, running this. I've played it twice now, once um, as GM and one, or keeper and, and once as a player. Um, it strikes me that the, the, the play could go in all sorts of different ways, um, given the, the interaction between the, the player characters and the non-player characters and, and the, the way the player character, characters are thinking about what's happening. And I wonder what's the most kind of surprising um, twist or the, the surprising avenue that the players have, have gone down when you've been keep, keeping? Well, I think my first big surprise was when I first ran it. And I was totally sure that when the first death happened and I gave the choice of, you know, the whole crew and I stressed to them, you play anyone from the whole crew and they just played, I think it was just maybe the cabin boy or someone quite inconsequential. And it surprised me. They didn't take someone of high rank uh, on, on board the ship. Uh, but I think, I don't think that's what you're asking about. I think please, that there is a lot of variation, you know, when people run it and the things that people do, I mean, I can I can remember some anecdotes, but as in terms of what's the most um, out there thing that's happened, I don't know. I guess when I run it, it tends to be it tends to follow a similar format, but then people are, are working around that that structure. Yeah, I can remember Matt Sanderson playing it and uh, and being up in the crow's nest and just at some point just launching himself into the sea and just trying to swim away. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the thing that sticks with me but uh, I don't know I've run it three times now uh, Paul and at some point people's attention starts to turn towards the captain's cabin and there's some magical thing that happens that people start saying we need to get in there we need, and there must be some clues laid in the scenario along the way that that is the source of uh, uh, what's happening and then pretty soon after that mutiny starts to enter the heads of the crew yeah, I think so. I think it's when I first ran it, I felt like players don't really know what's going on. And I think I tried to make the clues a bit more heavy handed, a bit more obvious. When Captain Chapel first turns up and sees the murder, he's muttering to Henry Joy, you know, that that's the first one. That's one down, two, you know, two more to go or something like that. And it's like I'm just spoon feeding the players things here, but they don't know whether to act on it or not, because that would be mutiny. And so you've really got to, to give them the clues and let them, or, or at least give them very strong hints and then let them overcome their reluctance to act uh, and sort of push them. And obviously it is, you know, is something to do with the captain. It's something to do with, you know, his conspirators and Henry Joy and people like that. And yeah, they do often end up, you know, trying to tackle the captain or break into the captain's quarters. Yeah, it, it is. It is wrestling with that idea of you know, when should we act, and I think the early um, scenes where the religious items have been stolen. That's the moment when people start to really engage with um, what could be going on. Yes, yeah. I mean, there's some red herrings there, but also, you know, is the is the paranoia of one of the conspirators that that he thinks that the religious items. Will be then there are no significance, but he thinks there are significant, so he's collecting them all up and, and throwing them overboard. So it adds a perhaps some level of intrigue and it adds in something that the players can, you yeah, know, react against. There's a lot of atmospheric detail that you uh, build into the, 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 the whaling ship. Did you discover things along the way um, as you were doing it? I mean, particularly, it's like that thing of uh, putting the hook through the uh, nose of the corpse as it's being chucked into the uh, sea. Right. And, uh, all those little tiny details and about the uh, pots and that kind of thing. I mean, that that particular detail about sewing up the, the um, well, not the, the coffin, but the, the, the body bag and putting the last stitch through the nose, that was inspired from Master and Commander, the Russell Crowe film. Uh, which fantastic, you know, ocean going film, fantastic film. And in that ship, in sorry, in that film, they do meet a um, a whaling ship and take on board a bunch of whalers. So that was that was a bit of an inspiration. And I did a lot of research about whaling ships 
and you know, searching the internet for plans of whaling ships and find out what was on board. And then you find a, you, know, you find these plans. And there's all these things labelled. I had no idea what that word means or what that thing is. So then you got to research that, and I wanted it to be, you know, as, as authentic as I could make it. So, and it was important to have a, you know, a deck plan and a ship plan, uh, and also the the cast of characters to have characters that seemed because it's hard to know what what kind of diversity of characters would you have on board a ship like this. And you know, having read Moby Dick and other you know, real life documents from the time, there was a, a pretty wide diversity of people on board the ship. I realize I'm talking about diversity in a cast of characters that are all men. And I did wonder about putting female characters in because it wasn't, I think it wasn't particularly common to have women on board, but it certainly wasn't unheard of uh, to have like the captain's wife um, or perhaps somebody else uh, on board. It was relatively unusual, but I just decided that in the spirit of Moby Dick, I'm just going to keep it to an all male cast on board. It just felt it would be a bit contrived to have you know, the captain's wife as well. I didn't really feel there was a role for that. But the one thing I did think about doing was just making like an alternate version with just a full female cast. But the thing that stopped me doing that was like, I don't think I can ask Lucy to do a whole another 23 character portrait. Well, related to that, I'm going to ask uh, Tristan to ask his question because it's about some other influences um, hmm. to support the uh, research. Hi, Paul. Um, you mentioned Hi Moby Dick being a um, reading inspiration for the scenario. Um, I was just curious what other nautical novels or materials were um, were inspirational in writing the scenario. Uh, there was a well, not books, but a film that came out about the es- I think it's the Essex, which was, I believe, the one of the inspirations for Melville, uh, and that film portrays the, the Essex and its fate. And the list of crew members is is pretty much the cast from the Essex, the, the crew from the Essex, uh, with a few minor adaptations. Whether there's anything else, I think other things is just general, you know, general background research, really. But that that would be the other uh, main thing. Was, is there anything else that you would refer me to? Um, yeah, Arthur, Arthur Gordon Pym from Edgar Allan Poe. Um, ah, I right. It was quite. It was quite. Uh, it was quite an inspiration for Cthulhu, I think, um, and I, it has a lot of uh, quite dark themes in it as well. Right, yeah, I, I recognise the name from reading. I think Lovecraft mentions Arthur Gordon yeah. Pym at some point. So that I it's have to one of it's not one of those only um, novel length ones, so it's quite unusual. Right, yes, yes, okay, I'll, I will check it out. And people in the reading group have mentioned Northwater. I think possibly it, that came out more recently, did it? It, I think it did. Yes, yeah, mm. yeah, um, but it. it, it does have um, some uh, detail uh, that could uh, support your uh, framing of this if you're going to be a keeper so it's worth, worth yeah i think you know whenever you're running a scenario if you can just familiarize yourself with the, the setting and so on so if you're running you know down dark trails well there's loads of westerns you can watch um but not so much for you know a, a moby dick type setting uh, so any of those things just to get the images and the feel of it in your head because it's very different to the modern day. I'm going to ask uh, Abs to come in. He might not be able to contact us because he's on his way to his granite in Aberdeen. Uh, hello, can you hear me? I can, can hear you, Abs. Hi. Yeah, hi, Paul. Uh, hi nice there. to see you. Uh, very evocative scenario with some great game design twists. Thank you. Um, we had a question uh, subtitled uh, the, the Barclay or Riley. And it's sort of about the genesis of it. You've touched upon it a little bit, but did you want uh, did you want them to find the sunken city? So you came up with a way that a bunch of people would be around there, or did you want to set it on a whaling ship and then just decided I'm going to take advantage of that? Or just to touch a, a, a mm-hmm. bit more upon the the genesis of the of the scenario? Yeah, I think it was very much one like I said earlier, where I didn't know what it was going to be when I sort of started it. So the, the, the starting premise was it's just a whaling ship. 
and then I just explored that theme and things that could come out of it. I had the idea that it was on a whaling ship, and then the idea of a sort of slasher type movie framework developed. But then it got to be, well, why is that? What is the, you know, what is the, what are the baddies trying to do? What is the captain actually trying to achieve? If it's the cap, kind of got to be the, maybe the captain and a few of his men, they formed a conspiracy. But what is, what's the genesis of their conspiracy? Why are they trying to do this? Well, I think I decided it was something to do with Chapel's father. And, you know, maybe they'd seen visions out in, at sea. And then, you know, it just sort of came to, well, the obvious thing is that, that you yeah, know, they, they do sail a very long way. I remember, this is one of the things that I got from reading Moby Dick. I, I think without reading that and without doing any research, I would have perhaps thought, well, whaling ships, they went out for a few weeks and then they'd come back. That, you know, as, as somebody who knows nothing about it, that was kind of what I thought. And then I read Moby Dick and it's like, no, these ships go out and they're out for years. They, they can be out for like months or, or two or three years away from, uh, their home so they they do sail you know thousands of miles well okay well if they're sailing a long way they could be sailing you know past Rilie. and it's called call of cthulhu right but cthulhu doesn't appear very often so i try and give him as much, much love as i can so they get to Rilie, chap they they saw it at a distance once a long time ago uh in a in a past uh in a you know, aboard a past ship a handful of them saw Rillier, really, eh? but they only saw the top sort of spires poking out of the water. And each one of the conspirators had a sort of a different vision of it, had a different sort of takeaway from it. And for the captain, it was he heard this this thing calling up to him that he sort of thinks is his father. Um, so he wants to get back there. And and then if it is really, eh, I wanted them to to be able to sort of enter it in some manner. And with the herald at the end, sort of taking them down, and they kind of get a vision of you know going into Rillie and the presence of, of Cthulhu being in there. We don't actually see him, but we kind of feel his presence. Uh, and yeah, so that that was the that was the route that 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 developed through. So I did I kind of didn't hadn't got that in mind when I began, but it, it just kind of river revealed itself as I kind of worked through it. Uh, Fabio made that exact point, uh, Paul. That you know, call of Cthulhu. You very rarely see uh, Cthulhu, and mm-hmm. uh, it's it's good to have him as a central figure in this. Yeah, I mean, he's he's a hard one to bring in, right? Because if you stick Cthulhu in, well, he grabs one d four investigators per round and like eats them. <laughs> <laughs> so he's not an easy character to bring in. He's, and if he's stomping around, well, you kind of lost. Um, so I've got a couple of scenarios where he features, but he's either like a dream vision or, you know, like in this one where you're actually visiting him rather than him visiting you. I want to talk about the finale, how it, uh, how it comes to that conclusion. And um, because, and I, I've run it and, um, a couple of people in the book club have run it. And it, it is, it is a challenging scenario to run for a keeper. So yeah. what what advice would you give uh, for the staging of that uh, finale when there's multiple visions taking place and there's all kinds of uh, things occurring? I mean, I think you're right. I think it is a difficult one. It's, it's a challenge. And when I kind of wrote it down, it was a challenge to write as well, to try and, as I'm, as I'm writing these things, I tried to make it as, I tried to find, modes of writing it and you know perhaps like i put a table of sort of um a table of information in there to try and communicate to the reader to the keeper what's going on i try to make that as user friendly as i can but sometimes i kind of end up making a rod from my own back and making it quite complicated uh and i do say at the start of the the book and in the you know in the listing that this is if if this is the first game you've run, you you might want to play something else because this is quite a difficult thing to manage. But equally, if you read it and you want to run it, then you know knock yourself out. Go ahead. I think yeah, probably read through that final bit a couple of times and get your head around it. And sometimes if you if you have an interpretation for you that works well, then you know change it. 
you know, go with what, go with something that you as the keeper that you feel happy with. You know, so if you want to leave out an element of that or, or add in a different element, you know, great, you know, make it your own. Um, so that whole thing of some of them having visions and having almost two conflicting visions at once, I think something like that, make a rod from my own back and you know, at times or like the, you know, there's somebody who's a killer and there's another victim. And sometimes I've, I've cocked that up and like half, halfway through the game, I've realized, oh, bloody hell, <laughs> I've done the wrong thing here. Uh, but the players don't necessarily realize it, but uh, as, as people, you're like, oh, yeah. So it, it's one that is, is, is tricky to run. I don't know if there's any more advice that I can offer than what I put in the scenario because I wrote it and then I gave it to people to play test and then I added in or, or edited the advice to try and make it as clear as I could. So it's probably more clear on the page than I could describe in words right now because you know if I just try and put it in words, I'd probably make it sound more confusing. I, I suppose I what I'm in- that's helpful. <laughs> I, I suppose what I'm interested in because I think you know it is a challenge to write these things, isn't it? Because they're both describing something which is incredible. And also giving instructions to people on how to, uh, how, how to do it, how to stage it. I'm just interested in how, when you've been a keeper, how you've done it. Have you kind of explained to everybody what's happening or do you take, uh, point to a particular player and say, this is what you're experiencing of this? How, how, how's that played out uh, at the table when you've run it? Yeah, I tend to go around the table try to look at each player in turn and probably just go like right to left around the table and say, okay, well, I'm going to take each of you and sort of say what you're seeing. And you might sort of say, okay, you two, this is what, this is what you perceive. You know, there are characters climbing up over the side of the ship and sort of like coming towards you with their hands reaching out. Uh, Other ones are seeing the, the captain next to the herald. So I try and sort of personalise that, I suppose. I think particularly at the climax of the scenario, you want everybody really invested and you want everybody to feel like, you know, I'm getting like the spotlight shone on me and, and give the players you know, time to react as well, to sort of express what they're thinking and what they're personally doing and then just try and keep all that in your head but but keep going round from player to player uh, is is how I tend to approach that. Yeah, because yeah. when I when I've done it, I've done it online, and it obviously right. has that challenge, doesn't it? That uh, of speaking directly to particular uh, players, and I think I do think um, if I run this face to face, it'd be more effective because you just have that physical staring at uh, somebody and saying, "This is what you're seeing. This is what you're experiencing." Yes, I think so. I think there is. I mean, when I have run it face to face, it's been. I think it's a particularly good one for being able to sort of not take people out of the room and talk to them, but just go up to, you know, if you, if you can walk around the table and lean in and whisper to somebody and sort of tell them what, what they're perceiving. But, you know, I I tend to whisper so loud that I make sure other people can hear too. Um, it's like they're kind of, so they're getting a taste of what that, that person is, is uh, experiencing. But at the same time, they're feeling like they shouldn't hear it. But, you know, yeah, just, it's just, any way you can build atmosphere really and there's a nice twist at the end for people who escape on the whaling boats at what point did you uh, come up with that uh, little that was late on i don't think that was in the first few runs i mean this 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 is a game that i ran a lot a, a lot of conventions first time i ran it at concrete cow um i had mike mason and um a bunch of other people in there um and i pretty sure that wasn't in there i think it just occurred to me that that one time there was a bunch of people in a lifeboat um well you know a whaling uh, boat out at sea just rowing away from the barclay as it, as it sank into the ocean and i figured well actually you know captain marsh he could be he could be sailing by there the, i think maybe i did have like a whaling another whaling ship come and rescue them because they would have 
uh, like meetings with other ships out at the ocean, and that you know it's kind of like a a way of uh, you know, meeting other people uh, that, that signal them and uh, and meet up. Uh, and that's something we see in Moby Dick that happens a couple of times, as I recall. And then, well, it just seemed obvious then that that, that would be you know Captain Marsh, and uh, it just seemed like, like a, a a kind of a a comical twist at the end, I suppose. Yeah. Particularly with the sea and, shanty. It's... Yes. And <laughs> who would have known that like the year that I published it, like I don't know, was it like the year before last, that whole sea shanty thing just just blew up online. Um <laughs> and uh but previous to that I'd been to Necronomicon in Providence, the the, uh, the Lovecraft uh, convention, and the HPLHS were there, Andrew Lehman and John Branning. And they run one evening in a bar. They take the bar over and they get everybody singing their sea shanties, their Innsmouth, you know, for their Lovecraft inspired kind of Innsmouth sea shanties. So they take all the traditional sea shanties and rework the words. And they are, you know, they're great performers. And they get, they get about four of their cast members singing uh, the, uh, the, the verses. And then everybody joins in on the chorus. In, in the whole bar and uh yeah it's just, it's just great fun and i thought well i've got to try and incorporate that so i got in touch with them and, and got permission to uh include uh what would you do with an innsmouth sailor uh, so you can you know you can download that track and you can either play it to your players or you can get your players to sing it and i've, I've had a few people say that they did get their group singing sea shanties which is uh which is great I've got one final question from Fabio. He wants to ask about your future plans and what other things you've got. Uh, just wondering what you're up to next. Uh, and thanks for the love of Cthulhu. <laughs> <laughs> Part of what the uh, Mystic Repository has provided for me is an avenue to put out some scenarios that I've had around for quite a while. And some of them have been previously published that I'm just relaunching. So I've put out Dockside Dogs my Reservoir Dogs inspired game. That's on the repository as well. And I've got a couple of others that I'm going to rework and put out. So I've got one that's pretty much ready to, to go, really. I just need to find the time to, to finish it off. It's always like the last 5% of the work, but yeah, as people say, it takes like 95% of the time. Uh, so that's um, there's a sort of science fiction inspired one called uh, My Little Sister. And uh, that appeared in a previous collection of scenarios, but that's no longer available. Uh, and I've got permission to to put that out on the repository. So that's that's going to be coming out fairly soon. That's another one that's, you know, it's got a, a significant twist and is inspired by another film. And I've also got one of the first things that I published, which was Gatsby and the Great Race. That was published as a, a Moolah, which, which is a, a sort of publication format that Chaosium used to use. And, uh, I'm going to revise that because that's you know that's that came out about 17 years ago. That was one of the first things I had published, and that's another game that's like quite hard to manage. That takes lots of players and uh, and, and multiple GMs. So that's that's another one that I kind of want to get out. Once those are done, then it's kind of onto new territory, really. Um, so after that. You know, it's a, it's a fairly clear slate, but um, hopefully there'll be more scenarios to work on. And of course, you've got um, a scenario uh, that I know you've done because uh, I've run it uh, that's appearing in the next Blasphemous Tome. Yes, the the, uh, the Blasphemous Tome, which is the fanzine we do for the Good Friends of Jackson Elias podcast. Uh, that's been a little delayed uh, in production, but is yeah the writing i think is pretty much finished uh so that's that's all pretty much ready to go so that should be out in the next like month or so um and again you know well you were kind enough to let me have the audio of the of the of your playthrough Dirk, which is always immensely helpful um it's, it's the best like play testing feedback that, that i can get is an actual recording of the game because sometimes people send play testing feedback, but you don't really know if they did what was on the page. So they'll say, "Oh, you know, oh, it was, it was good. We did this, this, and this." But yeah, it's like, well, okay, but what did you actually do? 
but when you, when you send me the audio, you know, I can hear exactly what you did and how exactly how people reacted to it and the bits that you, you know, you added in or the bits the players kind of added in themselves and the characters they played and, and you know, the directions it went. So that was, that was really useful. So thank you very much for that. Oh, that was great. Well, you're welcome. I always enjoy uh, running your scenarios. I think I've given you the feedback before that I do think the Oklahoma chapter in Two Headed Serpent is one of the best uh, that I've run. Uh, I, I love that scenario. It's really good. Oh, thank you. It seems to polarize people a bit, a little bit. So I, I had somebody at Gen Con sort of say that that was one that stood out to them that you know, they didn't like so much. But um, I think because it stands out as, as different to the others, I think. Yeah, definitely. And the, so that, uh, you know, that, that was kind of intentional to make it different. And the Gozu ending, because. <laughs> which we watched together for uh, oh good, God, friends yeah. <laughs> good friends of Jackson. Good friends of Jackson Yeah. So, yeah. Well, you have to take inspiration wherever you can get it, and you know, <laughs> if it, has, it, it was inspired by Gozu. You're quite right. Yes, yes. I've kind of forgotten that. <laughs> well, I tried to forget it, and Thank I think you. We, got, we, we even featured that in the artwork as well in the in the book. Thank you very much, uh, Paul, for uh, spending time uh, with us, and uh, I hope you enjoyed the rest of the weekend at Continuum. Yeah, thank you very much, Dirk. Thanks for featuring Full Fathom Five on the podcast. And uh, yeah, I will. Uh, I will go about. I've got another game to run this afternoon, so uh, I hope you all have a great day. Actual play. Okay, the call's gone up a short time ago. A whale spout has been spotted, and there's the rasp and uh, roiling of uh, chains as the uh, boats get lowered into the sea so three of them have been uh, lowered in and uh, each of the boats have given pursuit to different whales um, so right now you're in that boat and you're rowing for your lives and um, so Isaac uh, you're the steersman you've got your hand on the uh, tiller and uh, shouting at the guys to uh, come on you know pull can't you pull can't you okay. going on as you uh, Going ahead, chasing this uh, this whale with your uh, rowing rowing oars, and the, the sky's clear, and the sunlight is sparkling. The spray as you go in pursuit, and uh, right now uh, the prow is rising and falling as you are making your way through uh, the sea. You're going to uh, try and capture uh, this whale. So each of you, apart from Isaac, because Isaac has got his hands on the tiller. Um, do you want to shout at them, um, Isaac, to give them some roles here? Because they've all got a roll under the strength and be successful. Otherwise, you you, you lose this uh, whale. Shout at a man. Shout at them. I put your backs into it, you women, or we'll lose it. I can see it. We're gaining on it. Come on, I'll be no drink for the next week. Let's go. Okay, John, roll your strength Fritz. as a percentage. Failed. Uh, it, it, you failed. Now, you could burn some luck. Uh, that into a success yeah I'll, I'll burn nine luck just a success his, his hands are slipping off the oar as uh, he's, he's going forward but somehow he manages to catch it to keep up with the momentum okay um, let's have Matthew uh, okay, shout so at just... him Isaac shout at him while he rolls on, shout at me you dog <laughs> <laughs> just grimly so I'm just going to grimly pull on the oar and when he sort of as he sort of starts shouting at me i'm just going to kind of look over my shoulder spit some kind of matter <laughs> onto the onto the deck knowing that he'll have, he'll be the one who has to clean the boat afterwards anyway oh look at that very nice yeah strength is uh 60 60 so that's um uh, you've done you you've got a really good success there that's uh that's um, it cole come on Digging yeah. in, the rest of you full of suit, or we'll be going around in circles. <laughs> okay, Silas. Silas coughing. Go on, you're new to this. this exactly. Probably... I'm looking all eager now. Yes. Looking pleased. Pat me on the back. There we go. <laughs> That's it. We're gaining, lads. Come on. Come on. Okay, Herman, it's just down to you. You, you on its tail. You can oh, see it's you. blowing, it blowing a. There spirit. she blows her, oh, lads, get her! Oh, nice one. Okay, so you are now running alongside uh, this uh, this whale. So now's your big moment, and everybody <laughs> can shout at you, Isaac. Hold this steady. 
Okay, so what you have got are uh, two harpoons prepared, um, and you've got some spares as well. And so the blade of the harpoon is sharpened steel, got a coil of rope attached to it in barrels. So as soon as you spear it, your the the rope will re be released to uh, capture it. So this is a big moment now. You're going to have to try and harpoon this whale, throw in this uh, spear. So you've got to do a, a successful uh, throw roll here. 50. So I've got to get below 50, is that right? Yeah. yeah, yeah All right. right. Would it, would it shout help if we shouted at you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Come on, you blind <laughs> bastard. I'm in, the, <laughs> this one. <laughs> I'm in the zone now. Oh, can't, get my, can't get my chat up. Well, there we go. That's it, right. Come on, pull. Keep it steady. That's it. <laughs> My focus. Come on, get her. In my focus is um right on the right on the spout now. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> What'd okay. you call that? Uh, Who pulled? We must have hit a wave. We hit a wave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the, the the harpoon um falls into the into the sea. Um you got away from you. Um unfortunately isaac so if you're gonna do it this time you have to do it as a hard success so you have to get 25 or under because uh you're gonna have to hurl it further with the second harpoon yeah yeah okay and steel's glistening in the sun as you can we uh, can we aid him chris can we aid him anyway yeah you're, you're rolling you're oh, rolling okay. so, so keep we'll keeping go. momentum okay yeah, feel like a sinking feeling. Ready? Go! Oh! <laughs> oh! 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 No, I mean, this game that is a fumble. Yourself. Okay. Yourself. So, as as it lodges into the whale, um, you become dislodged, and the coiling rope starts <laughs> to lash a barrel around the around the place. Now you're going to have to do a dodge or go overboard, Isaac. Right then. Okay, because this coil is it's it's streaming out, but the barrels flying <laughs> around the place, and in these close quarters, it's going to knock you out. Yeah, we're all leaning to the <laughs> sides, like what's up? <laughs> <laughs> Just keep rowing. I've been here before. I've been here before. Yes. Oh, yeah. So, um, <laughs> as you do that, it the the barrel flicks up into uh, the air and overboard. And so uh, the harpoon is attached to the whale and the barrel, and it just goes under the sea and just the barrel is uh, floating. Are we, are we just like going to sit here? Are we like, what do we, like, what do, we do? So, so just, the barrel, the barrel just occasionally tugs. We hit it. Just watch the barrel. Wait for it to come up. So you wait for a while. Mm. Now might be a good idea to introduce uh, each other to you whilst uh, you're waiting. The Barclay is some distance away and you're out at uh, sea, bobbing along in this uh, still water, watching the barrel move. Yeah, so I'm John Dewitt and I'm second mate. Sure, Isaac Chase, um, born South Georgia, South Georgia Island, 27 years of age been on and off ships my whole life as you call poor sailor man out of portland uh, he's of indeterminate age because he's just so ranked in sort of filth and salt water yeah silas coffin <clears throat> 19 from uh, chesapeake virginia getting to grips with the job now been at sea now on this voyage obviously for 13 months herman shepherd 26 able seaman from Edgar Town, Massachusetts. As, you, as you're exchanging the tales and waiting for uh, something to happen, the the barrel seems to um, move quickly uh, towards you, and then stop and just float. Any views on that, Isaac? What, what are we going to do? We underneath us. I think we need to move away from it. I mean, is that a question or is that like a, are you telling us what to do? Like, this is what's going on in my head. <laughs> um, you just hear me muttering, I hate it. We need to row. So, so Herman, I think you're, you're in the middle of a pipe, aren't you? Though? Come on, row. Okay, let's row. What, are we going to row back to the ship? Which way do we just want keep, to head back? Or just, just row out? past it. Just row past it. Get away, get away. The direction yeah. we're facing. 
we ain't got time to turn around. Let's just row past it. Okay. I mean, just can I just have a look across to see what the other boats are doing if they've captured their whales? Yeah, as you, as you look across, uh, this would be the case. The one that led by Nathaniel West has caught a whale and they're uh, cheering and singing uh, songs as they as they approach, looking victorious <laughs> as, they, as they're dragging it into... Uh, into the ship and it's uh, getting ready to be hoisted aboard the uh, Barclay. Mr. Chase, we've uh, you've lost already one harpoon there, sir. And I think that if we lose, if you lose the second one, I don't think the captain's going to be mighty pleased there, sir. So why don't we just go up to the barrel and pull up that harpoon? Because I think that whale's dislodged it. Sir. We lost them both, didn't we? Didn't I chuck them both? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, so, 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 Herman, as you as you lean over the side uh, to recover that uh, barrel, um, you see a face in the in the water. When you look at it, it's actually the pale face of Margaret. I kind of stagger back in shock. Yeah, you're gonna have to roll a sanity. I thought so. <laughs> Okay, you lose 1d3 of sanity. So, so the rest yeah. of you see Herman uh, recoil. Uh, so just half the d6. Yeah, so one. Yeah, you just you just look at, you come over uh, shocked because the thing is, is that reaching your ears uh, are the words, come to me now and everything will be well. Goggle box. Welcome to the Zoom of Roleplaying Rambling. You've got to be flipping kidding. I've got Blythe with me. Hello, Blythe. Hello, Dirk. This is Grogglebot. We've watched a movie uh, that was with us and around us back in the day, and we want to look at how it can continue to inspire us today. And this time we're looking at John Carpenter's 1982 film, The Thing. I have to say, it is one of my favourite films of all time. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's a great. It is a great film. I know it's one of my favourites, but I, I do like it. It's there's, what, a certain it something, there's a certain something about it, isn't there? I think it has its flaws, but you you forgive it its flaws because there's something it's something what, about it that's that's great. Yeah. I don't know if um, you have the, these films that you default to, so I've got a stack um, by my side that I'll put on when there's nothing else on, and the. Th- the thing is one of them. The thing is one of them. <laughs> where I turn the lights out and uh, enjoy it, you know, at least once every couple of years. It's one of those that I never tire of watching. I know what you mean. Uh, and I would certainly put it in that category of the films that must be watched if they're on TV. So I have I have a list of films that if they're on TV and, and I can I can realise it on TV at any given point. So the not I'm not watching from the beginning necessarily because it doesn't matter, does it? Because I know the film so well. It's one of those films that if it's on, I watch it. It has to be watched till the end. 1982 was a great year for science fiction films. Shall I give you some of them that were came out that year? Are you ready for this? Yeah, Bl- go on. Blade Runner. Blade Runner Ooh. came in 1982. Mm. Tron. I think yeah. that's the, I saw yeah. that at the cinema. These other ones, yeah, I'm not yeah. sure as I saw it at the cinema. Star Trek: Wrath of Khan, which is the best one, isn't it? It's the best. It's Star the best. Trek. That's the standard view, isn't it? It's the best, the best one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mad Max Two, Road Warrior, another wow. one of my favourites. Yeah, yeah. got to watch that. ET, but yeah. I think a lot of these films had a life because of watching them on videotape. And watching them over and over. And I think The Thing is one of those. And I, I yeah. got it out, I think it's a bit later than uh, 82 that I watched it. But I was aware of it because of Starburst. And I was intrigued by it um, from the pre-publicity. But you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have watched it in the cinema because we wouldn't have been old. We weren't old enough to watch those kind of films in the cinema. That, I think that's part of it as well. They had a certain mystique because they were forbidden, weren't they? You know, you couldn't have watched the what would the thing have been in nineteen eighty two? Would it been an X certificate? I mean, Mad Max would have been the same, wouldn't it? You wouldn't have been able yeah. to watch those things when we were in nineteen eighty two. So, I suppose they had that 
that sort of mystique and my- mysterious quality to them, didn't they? And then when video came out, you could you could actually watch them. I yeah. just say it again and again and again. <laughs> and I um, was also intrigued by the um, earlier film, the 1951 film, A Thing from Another World, which is pretty good. It's, I mean, both of these films are based on the story, Who Goes There? So it's fairly solid, I think, the uh, setup. And I think it'd be good for us just to talk through how it works, particularly in context of Full Fathom 5, which I think uses some of the techniques that uh, are apparent in the thing to see what yeah. we can learn from creating that kind of environment in uh, gaming. Well, it's an interesting, the, the initial setup is interesting from a gaming perspective because when we rewatched it, and I, and I tried to rewatch it with my gaming glasses on, you know, that it, opening scene where they're chasing the dog, aren't they? So the Norwegians from the other base are chasing the dog and the dog is clearly infected. It's the alien, isn't it? It's the, the thing is in the dog. And when they get to the American base, no one can speak Norwegian. And there's a misunderstanding, isn't there? The Norwegian guy's got a gun and they don't understand what's going on. And then they shoot the Norwegian guy and think, Christ, he's just gone mad. The guy's gone mad and they take the dog in. And interesting from a role-playing perspective, because that is that is a high-risk setup, isn't it, for a games master? You're relying on people not understanding the language. It, that, that setup could go completely the other way, where they say, well, I'll tell you what, let's... Let's take the Norwegian guy in for a cup of tea, calm him down, and eventually he's going to tell them that dog's an alien, and your whole your whole scenarios up the wall. Then is <laughs> unless, unless uh, he's infected himself. I think at that point, well, I would that's make... what you'd have to do as a, as a game master. You'd have to, to twist the plot and go, "This has gone wrong." Well, he's an alien, so <laughs> yeah, the do- the dog's running away from him. <laughs> yeah, he's exactly turning on his head. Yeah, I mean it's a great opening for the film. It is a great opening for the film because, of course, as a viewer, you kind of know what's. I suppose the first time you watch, you don't quite know what's going on, but you do know what's going on to an extent. You have a suspicion, and of course, you you don't want. It's a bit like the iceberg in Titanic. Every time I watch Titanic, I always think, "Is he going to hit the iceberg again?" Oh come on! Yeah. And it's a bit like that, isn't it? Are they going to shoot the Norwegian guy again? Oh, come on. Why are you shooting? We're just a trigger happy, you know, trigger happy player character, isn't it? It's ruined it for everyone. Essentially, they're all screwed because some player character is 90% with a, with a gun and think, oh, I'm going to use this, I'm going to shoot him. Yeah, it, it's and what it my character all. would do. It's what my character would do. Uh, I mean, everybody else <laughs> has got their head in the hands and uh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just role playing. My character is, is a violent psychopath. That's what he would do. Oh, what have you done that for? <laughs> I, th- I think the I think the whole setup though, um, you can learn a lot, can't you, in, in game? Because you've got the complete isolation of having the Antarctic setting. You've got the other base that is there to explore, but it's a bit of an adventure in itself to get to that base because you know, it, it, the conditions are so harsh and mm. the whole intriguing thing of what could this be what could these impressions be what could the uh, what's happened here and uh, the, the whole setup i think is a perfect gaming opening yeah uh, that's true and it, it that that is an interesting thing isn't it the isolation and the element of how important really in a wider context isolation is in those kind of scenarios because what you never want in a in a horror thing is for the players to just draw on outside. You don't want them to ever ring the police or the authorities, do you? A polar exploration base is perfect, isn't it? Because even if you could contact people, there's no way they can get to you in time. So you are isolated. And that is quite central to those kind of scenarios, isn't it? Making sure that players are isolated and can't draw on help from outside sources. And that's a bit of a trick, isn't it? You've got to kind of pull in those games, I think. I think the other thing that it does very well that you could learn from gaming is it's got the character, um, I forgot his name, the younger character on roller skates. And early on, he's moving through the base and he's showing you the rooms and the layout so that you've got a complete awareness of what the space is, the confined spaces that they are living, and um, so you can learn a lot from that from a, a games master point of view. The importance of 
making the characters when they're in a confined space aware of right these are the key areas i think for full fathom five because that's got isolation in a whaling boat the locations that the players uh, can go to are very important to it and uh, yeah. there's only a handful of key locations but you just make sure that people the players are aware of the significance and how yeah. constricting it is show them the map and say this is this is where you are this is the space you're in again yeah. in that kind of, i mean i suppose like full fathom five on a ship there's there's the ship but you the sea is irrelevant because it's the sea and it's the same with like the thing isn't it there is an outside but it's so hostile cold you forget that you're trapped in this this is the space you're trapped in you can't go and run away can you because no. you die it's not just the isolation of being cut off from the outside world in terms of communicating it's being cut off in terms of this is you have to operate in this space because outside of that space is this is it's a no-go area. But it's like space stations, isn't it? Space stations, Arctic bases and ships are perfect because you can't go anywhere, can you? You can't escape. The other uh, thing that the film does really well that I think you can learn from, from gaming is the pre-generated characters are really strong and distinctive, uh, physically distinctive. Very quickly, you, you kind of associate each character with a particular type. You know, the laid back drug toting guy, the, uh, the young guy zipping around on his uh, roller skate. You've got the world weary doctor, you know, the stoical Blair play, played by uh, Wilfred Brimley. And you quickly establish, don't you, without really the, them telling you anything that the, the, this is the character role. These are the archetypes that they fulfill. And this is the attitude to the setting and where they find themselves. Every time I watch it, I find it incredible that immediately you want McCready, Kurt Russell's character, to survive. And the, he doesn't, he doesn't do anything. <laughs> doesn't do anything, does he really? He just appears yeah. on screen. It's just his natural charisma makes you realize that he's the one who's going to get out of this. Yeah, I suppose it's that funny thing they talk about the, the in Hollywood, isn't it? The star quality thing that he's he's just something about that guy as an actor where immediately you think, oh yeah, you know, you're the you're the central character. But he's not he's not necessarily pitched that way, is he? It's not structured to say he's the central character, but he he does come across like that because of his natural charisma that he's got as an actor. Yeah, he's not be the yeah. greatest actor in the world, but. There's something about him, yeah. And and the fact that the other characters, even at the when it becomes its most uh, intense, uh, kind of defer to him, don't they? Even though they're resisting some of his uh, interventions and he falls under suspicion of being the thing. It's, there's somehow, somehow he's elevated above the others. And I can, every time I watch it, I can never put my finger on how he manages to achieve it just by hide, coming out from a hood. Um, with a great big beard, I don't, and uh, chucking his whiskey into an apple yeah, tree. Yeah, that weird, that weird, weird floppy hat he wears, doesn't he? Yeah. Weird, <laughs> weird hat he wears. What's that about? <laughs> right, you can't take your eyes off. We've rewatched it time and time again, but it's one of those films where there's a, I suppose, there's a distinct difference between rewatching it and the first time you watch it, and I suppose you forget the experience of the first time you watched it because you've watched it so many times subsequently. It was a different, slightly different, becomes a different film almost and a different experience in terms of watching because you've watched it so many times, you know what's going to happen. So you're watching it in a different light. But it, but it is one of those films, a bit like Alien, isn't it? And it has it does have a debt to Alien to some extent where the first time you watch it, you don't know who's going to be killed off. You don't mm. know who's infected and you don't know what's going to happen and that is a different viewing experience isn't it to subsequent watchings of it where you do know what's going to happen you watch it slightly differently yeah you know? and i had the uh, fortune of uh, watching it this time with my son who's never seen mm. it before and getting that vicarious experience of him watching it and a couple of things uh, that he pointed out was that um, the fact that it was a physical effect for the thing made it more terrifying. Whereas I think when I first <laughs> watched it, I thought it was quite a silly thing. 
I think I laughed at it a little bit. Um, I saw it as a humorous thing, but he thought it was terrifying because it looked like it was a thing that was actually in the room rather than something yes. that had been added later. It had a bit yeah, of well, it's that, that's yeah, that's interesting, isn't that? Because they do say that that there are filmmakers who say, no, no, the, these explosions are real explosions. We, we're doing it the dangerous, old-fashioned way of, you know, say there's an explosion in a film, you can do the CGI version, or you can actually do blow something up for real. In not the camera, CGI. yeah, in camera film uh, stunts. It, yeah, when yeah, when it, when it, show, it does does show, it does come across. It is you can something in your brain, you can sort of tell that oh, he really did jump across that ravine you know on a motorbike well, in, the, in, the, in, in the thing bar. in the thing when they um set fire uh to to uh, the guy's transformation he walks out and mm. he's on fire there was a man yes. on fire there was a man on fire yes <laughs> yes <laughs> no but and that is interesting isn't it like your, your son seeing that and think yeah it's a man on fire whereas now it would be cgi and you, you can't tell you know, it's cgi it's not a man on fire and in a way i know what you mean there is a silliness to the special effects, but it's an odd, it's an odd combination of silliness and this kind of grotesque horror, isn't it? So it's like when the hands are cut off when he's doing the the CPR on the chest and his hands get cut off and the chest opens. On the one hand, I know what you mean. You do laugh, but it's also a bit of a nervous laugh because it is so horrific. It's so kind of out there, isn't it? You know. Yeah, like when the head turns into a spider thing, the head falls off, and yeah. you know, or the or the chest opens, and you get all that weird spaghetti stuff quivering around, and you do look at it and think that's that's just a load of rubber wiring being shook around. But at the same time, it, there is something creepy about it. He wants and a good wash after you've watched it, don't you? You realise <laughs> something you? horrible about it, you know. You realise that the sound effects are doing uh, a lot of work. They're carrying a lot of it, aren't they? Because the, mm. it is the yeah. sound of it um, that is terrifying. It is the the horror. And I think um, sometimes you forget about that, don't you? The sound. I, I know that when I was doing Full Fathom Five, that I was very conscious that in the the way that it was describing it, it was like a very uh, sensory experience that you have to make sure that people are aware of how it smells and uh, how it feels and um, I think yeah the monster in uh, the thing really requires those sound effects yeah uh, and that's that's interesting isn't it from a from a role playing yeah. perspective because I'm as guilty of this as anyone when you run in a game you do forget about noises and unless they're very, very significant noises, or oh, you can hear this behind the door, and it's very significant. But in terms of set dressing, when you're running a role-playing game, it's very easy to forget about sounds. And it and it's really, really easy to forget about smells, isn't it? Yeah. You, know, you do find yourself defaulting to what players can see. Which can see this, you can see that. But what does it smell like? Yeah. What does the room smell like? What does – that kind of thing. And even, obviously, there's there's no smell in the thing. But there they is, respond to it, don't they? They respond they, to the smell. They, they respond. They respond to it, and as a viewer, you you get caught up in that the, this kind of disgust, the blood and the gore of it, where you think, oh, you know, there's something visceral about it and physical and unpleasant. That, yeah, in some in some films with better special effects, it's probably lost. I tell you what's interesting. I've watched the remake of the thing. They did a. They did a. It's not quite a yeah. remake. It's, they do one where it's set at the Norwegian base. Yeah, I've not seen that. Thing, you know, I, I can't. I can't remember a thing about it. Think about it. I can't remember a thing about it. And that's a modern film. But but the thing, the original, is imprinted on my brain because of those scenes where, yeah, all right, you know, in some senses, it's a dodgy special effect. But there's something about it. it sticks in your mind. Yeah. The other thing, they, they've took a lot of effort to distinguish. You mentioned um, Alien and uh, the previous uh, film, The Thing from Another World. It was a humanoid figure. And conceptually, they really go for something that is Lovecraftian, isn't it? That is beyond description. That is 
horrific because it transforms and disfigures and distorts and as they, as they realize uh, the impact on that i wonder whether that kind of then there was one um, scenario it is a challenge isn't it because you've got this thing that's replicating and um, the different characters and eliminating them uh, one by one there's a growing yeah. uh, paranoia so that kind of setup isn't really conducive to a role playing scenario, is it? That kind of thing that anybody could be um, infected by this thing. People being infected by it, you could that could work in a role playing perspective because you could do the player versus player thing, where some players know that they are actually an alien, they're actually infected, and might act accordingly, try and hide the fact, and that kind of thing. That might be quite interesting, but I suppose what's difficult is if you bump player characters off very, very early, you, you know, that's difficult because you'd have to then replace them. You'd, you'd, you'd be difficult when it's half an hour in, so your character's dead, hard luck. I think that's what's, that's what's audacious about Full Fathom 5, though, isn't it? That it does do yeah. that. It's a yeah. slasher movie on board yeah. uh, a ship, and characters do get eliminated, but they get replaced. And yeah, they do. And when we first played it, you, you, I was the first one to be, my character was the first one to be killed off. You, you killed him off. And there was a gasp, I think. There was a bit of a gasp of people going, oh, wow. Wow, your character's dead and we're only 20 minutes in. And then, of course, we realised, oh, I see this, this word. Yeah, people are going to be dropping like flies and you just get another character. Right, okay, that's fine. Yeah, so you can do it like that. Yeah, you'd have yeah. to do it like that, wouldn't you? There's no other way of doing it, really. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I think it just, um, it, it is a great horror setting, isn't it, to have that thing where uh, people are being eliminated, but it is a trick, tricky thing to do. Do you do mild? So as a concept, this thing um, that's landed out from outer space and its uh, mode of operation is to infect people and they look on that computer and that, that computer is brilliant, isn't it? What kind of programs that that can work out how long it's going to take to eliminate the humanity? That's a bit like that's where you get the debt to Alien, though, isn't it? It's a bit like Mother, the computer in Alien, isn't it? It's a similar, very similar kind of setup, isn't it? You know. <laughs> what it reminds me of is, uh, do you remember when you got your ZX Spectrum and there was yeah. a tape on it, and it's the only thing that you had, the demo tape. And um, the first thing was um, a game where you got rid of the blocks, you know, the it's a ball against the wall at the bottom. And then the yeah, second yeah. one, I don't even remember this. Can you remember what it was? It was hares and, hares and foxes. Do you remember that? Oh, God, vaguely, yeah. yeah. So it, it was a simulation program. It was really boring, but you could change the number of uh, rabbits that were in the environment and the number of... Um, foxes and it would calculate which uh, population would survive you don't mm. remember that I and do it, yeah yeah. and I think what, <laughs> the thing with <laughs> thing with the thing is that computer what, what it demonstrates is the attitude was, as kids I had, to, I had to computers because he goes in and he asks it you know how long and all these questions and there's this on the one hand there's this view that computers were like magic things that could tell you stuff they could tell you stuff they can't really tell you stuff. Then you realise you had to program them. <laughs> and I just remember as a kid thinking, hang on. So the computer will tell me things, but I have to tell the computer the things it, well, I want it to tell me before it can tell me. The yeah. point of that, this won't, this won't catch on, will it? Yeah. <laughs> well, let's face it, you got bored with that um, hares and foxes uh, simulation thing and wanted Manic Miner. So of, course you, of course you did. You went to Eugene's lair with the toilets chasing you. That's what you want. That's what computers are really for, isn't it? Let's face it. What else have they done for us? So, so Blair, uh, Wilfred Brimley's character, um, is as soon as he realises this, as soon as he realises the significance of this and that humanity itself is going to um, be destroyed, it, he demonstrates the sanity rules in Call of Cthulhu better than any character. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I thought that watching it, it does, doesn't it? Yeah, it is like he's failed his sanity role. And 
Yeah. And he's realised the full significance full of what he's seen. Full significance of what he's seen, yes. Yeah, full significance of the situation. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. He, go, he goes and isolates himself, doesn't he? Yeah. yeah. As a full-on... Yeah. Um, he, he, he breaks them off, doesn't he? he they, they're already isolated, but he ensures that if this yes. thing gets out, if this thing is, can't get out of the base... And um, so yeah. he further isolates them and uh, destroys everything so that they can't uh, get out. Perfect example yeah. of uh, Call Cthulhu Sanity Rules. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is, it is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Realises the full significance and then loses enough sanity to uh, go temporarily insane and smash everything up. Okay, we need to uh, talk about the end of uh, mm. the film and the final confrontation so it's uh leading to this and in, in some ways um the monster has already spent its um best uh, appearance hasn't it because the best appearance is when they're testing the blood mm. and uh, you get that jump scare always uh, makes you jump doesn't it don't matter how many times you watch it every set gets me every time that <laughs> i must i know what's gonna happen but just every a, time, go oh. <laughs> yeah. So, so by this, this point, I think the monster's shown its hand. So mm. um, Carpenter then goes about um, disguising it a bit again, doesn't he, by putting it under the floorboards and uh, ripping up the floorboards and its appearance uh, um, kind of becomes a bit more oblique uh, again. Um, and we're left with this sensation that... Um, the two remaining uh, characters are ultimately going to cop for it, but you don't know, do you? It's just drawn away, and you're left with a satisfying ending or uh, 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 an ambiguous ending. I don't know. What do you think? It's just it's definitely a strange ending, and I have read things where people don't like it and find it dissatisfying. And I suppose going back to the beginning of the film. The film starts in such a strong way, doesn't it? It's such a strong start to a film where you get the dog and the mystery and then all this horror stuff going on and the build-up and the paranoia and all great. And then I suppose there is – you could criticise it by saying at the end it feels a bit like a damp squib because you just think, oh, right, okay. I don't really know what's going to happen there. I presume they're going to die, but then I'm not sure whether they are. I mean, you wonder. I don't know about the history of the film, but was it was it a setup for a sequel? You know, I don't. Was it a setup? Did did did, did they think there's the sequel potential in it? So let's leave it hanging, you know, and and we could go back to it. I don't know. Possibly. I mean, some some people have said that it's kind of a brave ending because it leaves that kind of ambiguity, um, yeah. and it's not fully resolved. Whereas, like. Nowadays, we seek full resolution. All the um, plot ends tied into a neat bow at the end. And uh, but I, I think it it's it, it's the issue that you have with uh, scenarios like this is that the resolution is always unsatisfactory. It's always difficult to bring it to a satisfactory end because let's face it, you've got yourself into that position where it can only really go uh, one of two ways. The monster's defeated or they're defeated and because you've invested so much time with these characters, it's kind of drawing a veil over the ultimate demise, isn't it? Yeah, I suppose so. I I know what you mean. The difficulty is that part of the horror of the film is that you've built this monster up to be undefe- undefeatable. It can't be defeated. It's, it's everywhere. It could be, it could have infected one of them at the end, couldn't it for all, yeah. you know, um, and, and going back to the doctor, um, smashing up all the stuff and realizing that if it gets into the human population, then we're, we're screwed kind of thing. You built that up and this happens, it does happen in scenarios, doesn't it? you build up and build up and build up a monster or a foe or an enemy. And then you dealing with it at the end is difficult because as you say, if, if you defeat it, that feels like a damp squib because you go, Oh, this thing was undefeated. It couldn't be defeated, but they've defeated it. But equally, if it kills off the, all of them, 
that can be undecided. Yeah, exactly. it, it is it's difficult. I, I suppose the way the way to do it and the way some films do it is a kind of light bulb moment where it seems that it can't be defeated, but then there's a moment where the characters go, oh, of course, we, we can defeat it. By yeah. doing this, you, w- you would say it's like, that. like Terminator Two, isn't it? In Terminator Two, where he, he's kind of into liquid metal, and they do find a way. He he's kind of can't be defeated, but at the end, there's this moment of ah, of course, that's you would, the you way. You would say that. Be. You would say that because that's how you want um, scenarios to end, isn't it? You want the monster <laughs> defeated. You want the like. You feel you walk away and think ah, uh, it's unsatisfactory if you don't defeat the monster or find the fix. You know, that, well, yeah, I suppose, I suppose so, yeah. But yeah, you're right. That is my as a player that I do enjoy that in role playing games of feeling the feeling that you you can't win, you can't defeat it, and then the the moment where you go, of course, do this, let's do this. That's one of the joys of role playing. Where would you, you get ever, yourself out of a sticky situation? You know, a convention game. You're down to the last mm. uh, two players. The monster's still in there. Mm. Would would you then say, okay, let's leave it there at that point? No, 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 I wouldn't. And I have played, I have played in games. I have played one or two games at conventions, one in particular, where there was a sense that you could do nothing. You could do nothing to to defeat the, the monsters. You were all doomed. And that, that became apparent about three an hour, three quarters of an hour to the end. And I think the mood on the table changed a bit. There was a sense of, oh, well, no, whatever. Yeah, all right. Yeah, I'm dead. All right. Okay. You know, shrug. Yeah, all right. Because from a player's perspective, you just think, ah, I see, I'm just being yanked along here by by this, the games masters. I'm yanked along by the story. And there's nothing I can really do. I'm not I'm not allowed to, to do anything. And there was, a, there, was, <laughs> there was a moment where one player – said something like oh can i not run can i not run can i not and he said no no i'm sorry i have to draw a veil over your character's doomed he's dead and never it's all right okay i mean some people like that don't they but i i'm not a massive fan i'm not a massive fan as a games master doing that i think if i was a games master i'd i'd love to run a game that had lots of horror in it and felt very tense and felt that players were doomed but then i would always like the players to go ah let's do this and Maybe one or one survives, you know. Like it's like Alien, isn't it? You know, the, in the shit in the shuttle at the end. That's a great ending for a role-playing game. One player's alive; they're in the shuttle. Oh, boy, the alien's still in the shuttle. What are you going to do? You know, and the, all those stealth rolls, putting the space suit on, and and then hitting the uh, the door so it's sucked into space. That for me is a brilliant ending to a horror game. But it, 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 a monster that seems cannot be defeated. It's killed all the other player characters. One player is the last one. What are they going to do? They're now trapped on the shuttle. Talk about a different film now, aren't we? <laughs> They're trapped on the shuttle with the monster. What are you, you know? And that that for me is a perfect ending to a horror role playing, where the one player has managed to survive in a very clever way. See, I I would be tempted if this was my scenario. Because the whole fit, thing of it is the cosmic horror, isn't it? Of uh, that they come face to face with something out of this world, and it, we, it, humanity's never faced anything as horrific as this, mm. and it's been trapped in the snow, and it's finally released. My ending: I would have had a helicopter, a rescue helicopter, appearing, and then yeah. you've got the players with the dilemma then don't you do we get get on board it or do we refuse it and sacrifice ourselves well what what i would do as well what good ending i'd put in as well is you could do that that good ending but also maybe you let them defeat this monster and they escape but at the very end of the scenario they have to make a role to see if they're infected yeah and if they're infected that's humanity's doomed <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing that's all right that's okay yeah that, that's kind of fun isn't it that yeah you've won but you've not really won kind of thing yeah but i think there is that problem of 
I think we talk about this a lot, don't we? But player agency, that once you have a horror scenario where players suddenly feel that agency is taken away and they're just passengers in a horror story and they're doomed, can be problematic. It's problematic for me as a player and a game. I I wouldn't like to run games like that and I wouldn't like to necessarily play in games like that. Yeah. Okay, you can do. It's all right. You know, it's not the worst thing in the world, but. I like a bit of player agency. I like my players to have that agency where they can fix things if they're clever enough. And I also like as a player the idea that, you know, yeah, we're coming to the climax of this scenario. There is a way out of it. It might not be. And that's not, you know, it's not that the players can't fail. I'm not saying that. There's a difference between players failing and players not being allowed to succeed or fail because it's just a, horror story and you're just bobbing along this and the current of this horror story not nothing you can really do about it yeah is always a little bit dissatisfying for me as a player yeah and i think um by the very fact that you're doing horror you put in some of that player agency at stake because horror works like that doesn't it that you you know you as we've mentioned before isolation that the odds are stacked against you and you're facing oh, yeah, a yeah. Cert, certain doom i do think that um for a convention game or a, a one shot or something like uh four fathom five it's all right um as long as you telegraph that up ahead and people know that it, it's that kind of thing it's a slasher film it's a it, it it's a survival kind of adventure oh yeah the the odds being stacked against you is is great that that's that you say that's the nature of horror isn't it the idea that you feel god we're not going to get out of this alive what are we going to do but for me for me personally once you say to players or once players get the feeling that ah nothing we can do the the buzz goes out of the game their life goes out of the game a bit i think yeah because role-playing games are all about agency and difficult situations and taking risks and having ideas that's the whole fun of them for me anyway I don't just want to be a passenger on some games master's power trip of horror. That's not that's not for me. And nor do I want to be that games master having that horror power, horror power trip of just snuffing out players. The you know horror, horror power trip. Did you say Sign horror me up. power trip? <laughs> Sign me up. Go <laughs> oh, see uh, you, isn't it? <laughs> okay. Well, thanks for that. And uh, I think I'm going to watch it again. I think I am going to watch it again. <laughs> I'll watch again, less gladiators on, in which case I'll watch that. <laughs> Cheers, Blader. Bye. Are you looking for a D&D podcast with a dark side? Something more like Game of Thrones and less like Monty Python? Tale of the Manticore is part dark fantasy audio drama, part solo D&D RPG. There's no plot armor here. The dice make all the important decisions. Join me as I resurrect the excitement, wonder, and emotion of old school D&D. Made for a mature audience, Tale of the Manticore is both a fiction and a game. It's the story where chaos rolls. I'll get me caught! Okay, we're heading towards the virtual door. We're coming to the end of another podcast, and this is a time when we uh, put our coats on and we slowly can't get away from each other, so we're just chatting away uh, on the things that are occupying our thoughts so blithy what are you thinking of at the moment we've started pirates of drinax haven't we i'm running pirates of drinax and a long-term commitment to our saturday signed morning up. group signed up um to that and we created characters we we went through the traveler create character creation process as a group didn't we uh, which was a, it brave, was a lot, it was a lot brave and audacious thing to do i i'd say it was uh well, it was, but it does it does say in the rule, but it does recommend in the rules that you do it as a group, and you can see why, can't you? Yeah, you know, because uh, as you're going through that life path, there are various intersections where you can bring in other characters and get yeah. advantages, isn't there? Yeah. So as this rule, the connections rule, where it's probably worth saying, it's very similar to the original travel, but it adds in certain life events. So you every term in a certain whatever career you're in, you roll a life events table or a mishap table if you fail your survival roll. You don't die, but you get mishaps. And what you can do is bring in other player characters around the table into those life events 
So if you, you know, for example, in ours, Andy's character was, well, Jonathan's character was in prison, wasn't he? And Andy's character was a Varga, was on a peacekeeping mission. And we said well, on this planet, there was an amnesty and some of the prisoners were let out. Some of the, the low risk prisoners were let out of prison. And Andy's character uh, as a peacekeeping force supervised that and met Jonathan's character, that kind of thing. Yeah. So you can bring, and it does does work really well, actually, bringing, bringing around your characters. It was a bit like the Persuaders, wasn't it? Um, mine and John's character. Um, you know, the, the opening montage of the Persuaders where you've got uh, <laughs> Roger Moore's character who's got yeah. a, like, a charmed life and you've got Tony Curtis who you know, lives <laughs> on the streets of uh, Brooklyn and yeah. gets raised up. We, we, we both tied off as rogues um, doing a hit. He got That's arrested right. and I decided... <laughs> to make a deal with the target for a, a favour to be uh, recovered at a later date. I went on to university whilst he was in prison and um, our, our stories kind of went together. All I wanted to be was an officer in the army and I yeah. didn't get there. But as yeah. he was made, he, he found some secret um, psionic institute and became... That's right. He, was, he, he did. He stumbled. Yeah, he was recruiting found the sonic institute and got sonic powers didn't he yeah. yeah yeah and it was good as well because although you and john character are human and this character is a varga i think what came across was the idea that even though you were human you were you were your home planet was probably in the varga extents yeah you know maybe that's why you never got the officer rank because you're not a varga yeah. you're in the army with vargas but as a human sidelined a little bit that kind of thing and it did it really good because it did paint a great picture of why these three characters know each other. Um, you also all ended up, I think you ended up with an enemy, didn't you? A Varga enemy. Yeah. So again, you've done a runner to to Drinax on the other side of the galaxy to get away from that character. Of course you won't. Yeah. That, that villain's going to come after you, know that. But, you know, it makes yeah. sense as to why you've all done what you've done and gone where you've gone. But it was, it was a lot of fun, actually. Really good. yeah. yeah. It just goes to show, doesn't it? I and mean, we've said this before, haven't we, that creating the characters is part of the game. And in many ways, it was like a, a whistle top through a, an entire campaign uh, that lasted for years and years, but we managed to do it in uh, in a couple of yeah. hours. Yeah, we've done this before. We did it with Mutant Year Zero, didn't we? It was the same group. And people had said it was great to roll, roll characters as a group, form those connections. And this was the same. Yeah. 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 Good way to do it because you feel already that you've got living, breathing characters before you even start. And um, that group in particular, that uh, on the Saturday morning, particularly um, goes for that kind of approach, doesn't it? So it, it worked really well. Yeah. My um, my closing time chatter, the thing that's uh, occupying my thoughts, is later on today we finish Children of Fear, which we started uh, this time last year, didn't we? Uh, Call of Cthulhu, Lynn Hardy's uh, epic campaign uh, through China and um, Northern India and the Spice Roads and uh, around Tibet. And um, yeah, we, we've we've come to the uh, finale. We've talked about uh, the thing and its conclusion. I have that sense of dread as a games master as if we can resolve <laughs> this in a satisfying way because... The whole campaign, in essence, has been collecting items for uh, a ritual that is going to be performed at uh, eight o'clock or quarter past eight tonight. We start to perform the ritual. And um, yeah, I'm, it, it's staging that kind of thing. Always a challenge, I think, because of the things that you mentioned when we talk about a thing. How much can you as uh, players impose yourself or? decide the way things are going because there is a sense of momentum um, because necessarily a ritual follows a process that you'll be part of but what opportunities will you have to either disrupt it or just impose your character into that situation yeah it is always a tough thing ending those big campaigns every time I've ended one it's always been I, I wouldn't say it's not been uns unsatisfactory Sometimes it's worked, it's worked, but it, the, there is that nervousness that, yeah, how do you, how do you end it before the final credits roll? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> you're going to end it in a, a satisfactory way. But Children of Fear has been really good. It's been a really interesting Cthulhu campaign because, as I think we may have said before, it's not really – it is Cthulhu, but it's not conventional Cthulhu, is it? It doesn't quite draw on the mythos in the same way. So, as I think some of the players have said, you can't quite second guess what's going on because no. it's not the conventional Cthulhu yeah. stuff. It, it disarms uh, players who want to metagame it through their knowledge of yeah. the background and the the setting, and uh, because it creates its own setting, it creates its own world, nineteen uh, twenties yeah. in that uh, particular location, and creates it like it's um, a fully realised, almost fictional setting because it weaves in historical information with. Um, the plots and what's going on, but it it's an adventure. It's an adventure, isn't it? It's a it's a treasure hunt. It's a, a, a chain of seeking out MacGuffins. It relies, I think, quite heavily on the cultural elements of of where you are in the world at that time in history. So you know you're you're encountering cultures and peoples that it's not just about dealing with the Cthulhu stuff. It's also dealing with the cultural differences without without giving too much away. There are a couple of bits that are quite probably quite stark cultural differences that you have to get your head around as a player. Their culture is very different from our culture and you have to kind of engage with it. Yeah. Can't say too much because it's spoilers, isn't it, for people? <laughs> but there's one there's one bit in particular where there is a real culture clash in terms of their culture's attitude to death and our culture's attitude to death. And that is quite interesting. You know, a whole, whole scenario really was about about that. We've got yeah. uh, lots of uh, gaming to look forward to after the desert of the summer. So yeah. um, getting, getting back into it. Nice one. See you later, Blythe. See ya. Are you sure it's my round? Thank you to Paul for taking a break from his attendance at the busy Continuum Convention to speak to us from behind the bike sheds. I really enjoyed the discussion. We have another Meet the Author in November. Bud from Bud's RPG Reviews will be talking to us about Viral, his modern day colloquy scenario which he co-wrote. You'll have also heard the advert for Tale of the Manticore which I appeared in as Lord Rabbit. Listen out for that. Hot on the heels of this particular podcast will be the next part of our Savage World episode where we'll talk about settings and powers. Please like and subscribe and tell your mates. And until then, adios, amigos. And it's all for me, bro. It's all, it's all, it's all, it's all.